Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you all to the importance of electrification in the transportation industry seminar. My name is Adrian Prazio, and I'm here representing Professional Engineers Ontario Oakville chapter. It's a pleasure being back on stage working with the Oakville Chamber of Commerce on another symposium where we're going to talk about some important issues that affect business and engineering in the province. It's no surprise that sustainability is a hot topic right now, and it's why the UN has adopted the Sustainability Development Goals. Today, we're going to be talking about three of those, the Sustainable Cities and Communities, which is Goal 11, Climate Action, which is Goal 13, and Partnership for Achieving These Goals, which is really Goal 17. And you'll see that through the cooperation between the PEO, the Oakville Chamber of Commerce, and the organizations represented by our speakers. Electrifying tra the transportation sector is a really important part of how we're going to meet climate change goals and how we're going to reach a more sustainable future. Today, we have three key speakers. Anaisa Franca, representing WSP, Marlene Charmandy, here with Ford Canada, and Keegan Tully with OPG. The format today will be, after these opening remarks, I will introduce a speaker, Anaisa Franca, to begin with, then she will speak for 10 minutes, then I'll introduce the next speaker, Marlene Charmandy, and she'll speak for 10 minutes, and then Keegan Tully, 10 minutes, and at the end, we'll have a Q&A session. So with that, I'd like to start by introducing our first speaker, Anaisa Franca. Anaisa Franca is a senior consultant and engineer with the Sustainable Transportation Advisory Services at WSP. Since joining the team, she's been actively contributing to fleet electrification planning projects, including modeling the fleet performance and energy needs, planning for the required infrastructure upgrades, and creating technical roadmaps to support fleet operations toward achieving their greenhouse gas emissions reduction targets. She specializes in electric vehicle charging requirements and peak demand calculations. Her work has led her to support electrification projects for agencies in Canada, the US, New Zealand, Australia, and Israel. Through her various research projects modeling hydrogen fuel cell performance at a micro level and simulating electrochemical phenomenon to characterize battery degradation rate, Anaisa has acquired a strong understanding of the two technologies and their benefits for transportation applications. Anaisa is also the chair of the board of uh, InnovAE, uh, an organization that supports collaborative applied research and development projects in the field of electric transportation and clean energy in Quebec. With that, I turn it over to you, Anaisa. Thanks, Adrian, and thanks everyone for, for having me here. It's a, it's a great pleasure to talk to you a bit about um, giving you a bit of an outlook on zero emission fleet electrifications. Um, so again, as Adrian has said, uh, my name is Anaisa. I work for WSP, that is a global consulting uh, firm. Um, more specifically, I'm in the Montreal office right now, and uh, a lot of my work has to do with supporting fleet owners in adopting zero emission vehicles and their related infrastructure. So before we actually get started, um, I did have a bit of an, a question, an opening question for the audience, uh, and it's what's the first thing that comes to your mind uh, when you think about transportation electrification? So. Uh, I want to check in with Adrian. I believe we do have a bit of a box for Q and A. Um, so Adrian, I'm not sure if you're if you're seeing the answers here um, coming, but maybe we can give a, everyone a few seconds to just type down their answer and and, and their thoughts. Let's see hybrid cars, grid impacts, yeah. electric cars. Yeah, car. electric cars. Okay. Yeah, lots of cars. <laughs> Excellent. And okay. so, oh, interesting. Okay. Catenary overhead. Oh, well, there you go. We're going to be talking about this today. So that's great. <laughs> TTC. Okay, excellent. Well, with that, um, I'm actually pretty impressed that we heard things other than cars. Um, but yeah, most of the most of the time when you talk about electrification, you think the first thing that comes to your mind is a car or maybe a Tesla or a charging station or even an electric uh, pickup truck, which is um, you know, shown on this, on this graphic is the, the Ford 150 that I'm sure uh, Marlene from Ford will, will talk to us about a bit later today. Um, but the truth is that there is another side of electrification that bears a very strong weight in the decarbonization equation, and that's heavy duty fleet uh, electrification. And, and I'm, I'm glad to hear some of the answers uh, reflect that a little bit. Um, and actually a, a recent study from Pembina Institute has shown that up to 10.5% uh, of all of Canada's emissions come from heavy duty uh, fleet transportation, um, which is pretty massive when considering that it's uh, close to on par with the energy sector, according to that study in particular. So that means that there is a real opportunity to think about the other 
plates and the other side of electrification. And that's a little bit about what we're going to be talking to you about today and some of the innovations that we're seeing in this market. So why zero emissions? Um, so there is a very strong political support right now across Canada. And I thought I'd share with the audience uh, this news that just happened um, right this year at the COP26. Uh, actually, Canada entered an MOU and an agreement with other nations to um, accelerate the shifts, to, the shifts um, towards zero emission um, and medium and heavy duty vehicles. So the target is uh, now to reach 30% of new ZEV sales by 2030 and 100% by 2040. That's pretty um, I would say aggressive and, and pretty important. And that is going to be leading to um, you know, a lot of GHG emissions reduction in the future. But to get there, there is lots of work that needs to be done to prepare for this transition. So when we talk about fuel electrification, of course, and I'm sure Keegan will will talk to us thoroughly about the grid and, and the electrical uh, distribution here in Ontario. Um, but just wanted to bring back the fact that, yes, in Canada, we do have generally uh, green energy production uh, throughout the provinces. Of course, it depends on where you are. But generally, the trend is, is going cleaner and cleaner and providing um, you know, energy gener generation that is um, cleaner and cleaner. Uh, that being said, the other opportunity that we have is that the grid is highly reliable. Uh, and what you can see on the left hand side here, sort of the graph is um, actually an extract from the World Economic Forum in 2018. And what you can see is Canada is ranked 13. So not only is our energy fairly clean, um, it, it is also very reliable, which is a must have uh, in this electrification process if we if we really want to be able to decarbonize uh, our transportation systems as a whole. So just to give you a bit of a background, so so what we're seeing right now in terms of innovations and in, and in, in the in the fleet sector, let's say, um, is really coming from different advantages that are stemming from you know the operations of larger fleets, and so. Some of the advantages are, are listed here. So the, the reason why we electrified and we went first with electric bus uh, is really because they have known and centralized operations. So we know where the vehicles are stored and we can easily assess, assess um, when they need a recharge. So essentially, yeah, a bus will tend to have a fairly uh, given schedule um, and you'll, even though every day uh, one bus might be doing different travels, you roughly know what is the estimated travel distance and the conditions through which the bus will go. So that means that you can easily know when it's going to need to charge. Similarly, when you talk about uh, urban, uh, urban delivery vans, um, yes, the, the routes are very different every day, but roughly you know the shifts of your drivers, you know the dis total distance that could be potentially covered by your vehicles in a day, and at the end of the day, they might all come back to a centralized location, and so that is um, really an advantage that we're seeing. They also have predictable behaviors with variabilities that can also be assessed. Uh, the third advantage is that you have usually a designated storage area and location that can then be retrofitted for upgrades. So to give you an example, a transit agency might have its own garage or might have its own facility. And same thing for municipalities, they might have their own um, infrastructures so that you can then uh, go ahead and retrofit them. It's a lot harder when you're trying to put public stations on the road, for instance, because um, you know, these locations might not be owned by the city or um, you know, might, might be disrupting uh, different types of operations happening in the city. So that is a big advantage that we're seeing in deploying zero emission vehicles in, in this type of, um, of approach. Um, the fourth one is the lessons learned and innovative solutions that are tested in one field can actually be applied to different types of vehicles. And that's what we're going to show right now. So for some of you uh, might be aware of this innovation because, uh, because you've talked about overhead uh, sort of charging, but this is showing you uh, a garage in Edmonton. So in, in their newest uh, uh, transit garage, Edmonton Transit has installed these rows of what we call pentagraph that can deliver 150 kilowatt to each of these buses. And really, there are many advantages to these types of systems. The first thing is the bus can just come down and automatically connect to the overall system. It can be managed remotely. And just the overall charging process can be done in a fairly straightforward manner and even 
for automation, when we talk about automotive, um, automated buses, that's sort of the technologies that might enable it. Now we're applying this to buses and we're learn learning so much uh, from this, uh, such as, for example, the fact that it needs a lot of maintenance and questions like, when do you do the maintenance? Do you do it throughout the day? Uh, do you do it in the evening? How do you minimize uh, your, your impact on the operations? These are questions that are right now being asked due to pilot projects for buses, but can easily be translated into when you're trying to electrify larger vehicles, such as um, um, even trucks, you know. So um, that next um, sort of innovation is, is showing you a similar outlook. Um, so it's a pantograph charger. But instead of being at the garage, it's actually uh, installed endpoints. And uh, this particular one is, is installed in, in Vancouver. TransLink has deployed it. And you can see that it goes up to 450 kilowatts of chargers, um, of charging power, sorry. So that really, if you think about forward, you know, how, how could we create and replicate this type of uh, design to really serve different types of vehicles that are on the heavy duty side? So. Um, could we think about having endpoint terminal stations for trucks, let's say, um, at different, at, you know, even gas stations could have those now um, to facilitate the transitions. And so really, I guess the, the point is we're using these technologies in a predictable and, and, and known environment today uh, because a lot of the lessons can be repeatable, uh, but then this is going to be applied to different types of transportation mode uh, in the future. And other types of innovation I wanted to share with you. So on the top uh, right corner here, you could see that hydrogen fuel cell trucks are actually being tested right now in Alberta. Um, it's, a, it's a really good uh, um, and, and large uh, group and coalition that uh, is deploying that pilot project. Um, and so if you're interested in more, we can, we can talk about this some more after. Uh, and then at the bottom, you can also see, this is, um, I thought it was a, a good innovation too. Amazon US has developed sort of its own delivery van uh, they're custom uh, and they're starting to be deployed across the country this year. Um, and they've, they've developed basically the, the, the goal is to deploy 100,000 uh, um, vans um, in the near term. So there are really a lot of innovations going on all across North America, and we're learning so much from, from these types of tests. Um, now, just a quick note on what challenges, what are the biggest challenges that we're seeing in working with these fleet owners, working in these different types of domains. Honestly, it, they're pretty much the same <laughs> for everyone trying to get into that space. Um, the first one is really high upfront cost of the technologies. Um, currently, there is no real way around it. That being said, there now um, more innovative uh, business models that we do not know and did not see before. Um, for example, um, in, there's different bus manufacturers that offer you um, to, to, to basically rent to own your bus. So uh, instead of paying all of the price upfront, you're going to be renting your batteries and rating your equipment um, for a number of years. And so that really can support you know, transit agencies or municipalities and public organizations as a whole to procure these vehicles and procure the infrastructure that goes with it. And we're seeing also um, the, the government uh, stepping up and providing um, a lot of different funding options that did not exist even two years ago. So really there's a lot of, um, of movement in, in the support that we're getting um, uh, on the political side, I'd say. The other challenge is procurement specification challenges. Uh, where you used to procure a diesel vehicle with a certain type of, of ICE spec, um, this is not gonna be the case anymore. You're gonna need very tailored uh, specs that meet your operational needs, uh, such as the battery size, um, the motor specification, the charging specifications. All of this are, are really important uh, and will have an impact throughout because if you do procure different vehicles that don't meet your requirements today, you're gonna be stuck with them for a while. Uh, so you might as well get this, get this right uh, the first time around. So that's really an area that uh, our team focuses on a lot. The next one is operational challenges. Uh, and changes that are coming from uh, the electrification. Of course, these electric vehicles have a limited range. Um, and so that means that with a limited range comes, um, you know, uh, different changes, right? In the schedules, in the way you operate, in the way you have to think about, you know, adding brakes maybe uh, for your drivers to stop the vehicle, have a switch while the vehicle is charging and things like that. So lots of innovation going on in this regard. The fourth point is the electrical grid impact. So this is 
of course, working with your utility locally to having a good understanding of what are my connections, what is the expected demand in the area, and are you going to be able to meet my demand? Because we're seeing right now for electric bus uh, depot, you're talking about up to 30 megawatt for you know a 300 bus stations and, and garage without any optimization. But with optimization, you can get less. But 300, uh, 30 megawatt, sorry, is is significant. Um, and so these are the type of disruptions that we are looking at in, in, in assessing in our studies. And then this last part, which is also very important, is how resilient is your system going to be? You cannot usually afford to have your entire fleet not working because there's no electricity. So you really have to think about plan A, plan B, plan C. Um, and this is where we're really seeing the emergence of hydrogen in helping with um, this system resiliency and thinking about in the long term, could you have a section of your fleet that actually uses hydrogen um, as a way to, to just operate constantly so that you, know, you don't need as much power to operate a, a, a hydrogen fuel cell fleet. Um, and so that's sort of the solutions that we're looking at. Um, just sort of a, a last uh, information, just um, to give you a bit of the approach that we usually take to, to support our clients and to support fleet owners in getting to uh, their zero emission and developing their plans. We, of course, first of all, do a current state assessment and growth plan. We understand, um, you know, how is the facility currently, you know, how old is it? Uh, how does it look like? What's been the connection to the grid, et cetera? We then go on and model the fleet's uh, operations. And so for buses, it's a lot more straightforward because you know your routes, you know your system, you know your schedule. Um, but for other types of vehicles, it may be a little bit more complicated when you have non-fixed route operations, essentially. But there are ways to go around it. The third step is really to assess infrastructure gaps and understand at the conceptual level what is going to be required to change in your infrastructure. And that's usually where the highest cost lies. Um, a lot of different changes need to happen to your facility in order to, to get these new vehicles. It's not just putting one charger and then you go. If you're doing at a large fleet um, scale, uh, you're going to need a lot more thinking uh, to make sure that your operations are streamlined, especially if you do the maintenance on site. Um, step four, we need to assess the cost of the solutions. Um, and then step five is we to develop uh, this stage implementation plan and and then we do recommendations to move into pilots and implementation. So in a nutshell, those are sort of five steps that we take. I'll conclude my talk by just giving you some key takeaways. Um, so electric and hydrogen fuel cell buses and, and just vehicles in general are early in their deployments. So you do need still that ana ana analytical sorry, approach uh, to minimize the risks. Um, now we, in, in our team, we have supported agencies across the world to develop their long-term ZEV implementation plans. And so, you know, if you're curious and if you have more questions about projects around the world, uh, we can talk about this later. Uh, sustainability and resilience objective can both be met with proper planning. Um, and what we're seeing is it's normal to have a learning curve uh, when you electrify your fleet, there are lots of unknowns and yeah, there's a solution to every problem. So thank you. All right, thank you very much, Anisia. So our next speaker is gonna be Marlene Chamundi from Ford Motor Company. Marlene is the manager of government relations at Ford Motor Company Canada, where she works with a team to conduct economic and strategic analyses and dialogue with all levels of government regarding public policy, issues of importance to Ford Canada and the Canadian vehicle industry. In addition to her government relations responsibilities, Marlene liaises with Ford's US manufacturing and product teams on strategic issues involving Ford's Canadian manufacturing operations. Marlene has worked with Ford for more than 22 years and holds a BCom in finance from the Dusatel Faculty of Management from McGill University and an IMBA from the Telfer School of Management, University of Ottawa. She's also a chartered professional accountant and certified internal auditor. Marlene, over to you. Well, thanks, Adrian. I'm happy to be here with you today. Um, I will be spending my time talking about electrification and the revolution that's on, on, ongoing. Um, I will focus on what we're seeing from an industry standpoint, um, provide you with an overview of Ford's electrification strategy, as well as share some information on our recent investment to transform our Oakville manufacturing facility to a BEV site and additional investments announced a couple of months ago in the US. But before getting into that, I wanted to spend a moment talking about Ford operations in Canada. We are Canada's longest established automaker dating back to 1904. 
We do employ over 6,800 employee, uh, employees across the country in various operations, including our Canadian Vehicle Division, headquartered here in Oakville. That, that's responsible for marketing sales and service areas. We have manufacturing operations in Windsor, where we produce engines and conduct powertrain engineering and R&D activities. We have assembly operations at Oakville in our Oakville assembly complex, where today we build the Edge and the Nautilus. We have a connectivity innovation center that employs software engineers in three locations in Ontario, including Ottawa, Waterloo, and Oakville. And finally, we have Fort Credit Canada with operations across the country. And in addition to all of that, we have a network of about 430 dealers across the country who employ over 20,000 employees. So what's ahead on electrification? Let me start by saying that while adoption of electrified vehicles is still low, relatively speaking, it has been steadily increasing. And we do see that more and more Canadians are considering owning an EV. Electrified vehicles now represent close to 10% of industry sales in Canada with plug-in um, EVs, which is you know, battery electric vehicles and plug-in hybrids, making up about half of that and the balance made up of pure hybrids. This is up from 7% in 2020, 5.4% in 2019, and 3.6% in 2018. And not surprisingly, in Canada, Quebec, BC, and Ontario are where the majority of electrified vehicles are sold today. And the electric revolution is, in, is, a, is really a global phenomenon. In fact, by the next uh, decade, uh, globally, it's expected that electri electrified vehicles will outsell traditional internal combustion engine vehicles. And here in Canada, the federal government has an ambitious target of 100% ZEVs by 2035. And of course, Ford is fully committed to this transformation and has been for many years. The transition to um, ZEVs um, is definitely accelerating. And here's the picture for Canada. The slide provides data on I, um, from IHS on forecasted ZEV sales over the next 15 years or so. From 3.5% of industry in 2020 to 4.7% year-to-date 2021. And um, looking forward, um, there's a government target of 50% by 2030 and an additional 100% uh, target by 2035 to be 100% fully, you know, fully ZEV sales. As you can imagine, this will require significant investment by automakers, as well as shifts by cons in consumer preferences and behaviors. In order to reach the ambitious targets set by government, there are a number of barriers that need to come down to help Canadians make that switch to EVs and before we see the expected growth in ZEV adoption. So first of all, the cost of ZEVs is still relatively high compared to ICE vehicles due to the high cost of EV batteries. Battery cost is expected to come down over the next few years, but until then, we do need government incentives to help bridge the gap. Secondly, up until recently, there really wasn't many EV models for consumers to choose from to suit their, you know, all of their different needs and, and utility needs. Um, that's changing quite rapidly as new EVs come to market. Third, the lack of charging infrastructure is real and needs to change for consumers to feel comfortable that they can easily charge their EVs on longer drives and when they're away from home. And fourth, there's still a lot of confusion by consumers about the different technologies off being offered, including hybrids, plug-in hybrids, and battery electric vehicles. There's misconceptions about the capability of BEVs, and, and, the, and uh, there's a really a general lack of awareness about how they work, um, what their benefits are, and things like that. And we need to dispel these kinds of myths. As these barriers do come down, we do expect ZEV adoption to increase. As I mentioned before, Ford is all in on electric, on electric vehicles and the revolution. We are investing over $30 billion in electric vehicles by 2025. We will be delivering about over 40% of our global product mix as EVs by 2030. And Ford's strategy is to play to our strengths, making fully electric versions of our most iconic and popular vehicles first in segments where we perform well including pickups, vans, performance vehicles, and utilities. With our ultimate goal to deliver BAV vehicles together with a holistic ecosystem, 
that includes services to make customers' lives easier. Fueled by these investments, our, our ambition is to lead the electric revolution. We are working on families of iconic battery electric vehicles, including Mustangs, commercial vehicles, F-Series, and Lincolns. What's exciting is that the move to BEVs allows us to totally reimagine our vehicles and the way we develop them. Removing the engine, the transmission, the driveline, the fuel system, the exhaust, and all the other internal combustion components frees up design constraints that have dictated vehicle architecture trade-offs for more than a century. In other words, we're building bold and unbelievably capable EVs. And let me share a bit about what is coming, what is available now and coming soon. The Mustang Mach-E, which we first revealed in 2019, we started off by electrifying the world's best-selling sports car and the Mustang Mach-E immediately became the 2021 North American Utility Vehicle of the Year. That was a pleasant but not, not unexpected surprise, nor was the fact that it's selling faster than we can build them. The e-transit coming in 2022 to help Ford continue to lead the commercial sales um, as we electrify the world's best-selling cargo van. We're also delivering a 40% reduction in cost of ownership over comparable ICE vehicles, along with maximum uptime, another core customer need. Now, now let's turn to one of the greatest Ford icons of all time, the F-150. It's the most enduring symbol of who we are and what we stand for. We've now reimagined it from the inside out as an electric vehicle and created the smartest, most innovative, and most powerful F-150 ever. It does a whole lot of things that no gas-powered vehicle ever could, starting with the mega, frunk, mega power frunk. Mega because it has 14.1 cubic feet of space you never had before, with a hefty 400-pound payload so you can actually haul real stuff in it. Power, as in 2.4 kilowatt of power to use however way you wish, and the power opening feature, and frunk because it's in the front of the vehicle. All by itself, the mega power fronts changes the way we think about how a truck can be used. Now I want to touch on another area where scale has huge implications, and that's charging. As numerous, numerous surveys have shown, the biggest perceived customer concern is the fear of being low on power, but that's also the biggest mis misconception. The fact that is that the vast majority of charging happens at home, and it's as easy as plugging in your iPhone before going to bed. It takes a few seconds as opposed to the minutes customers currently spend at the gas pump once or more per week. Every morning, the customer is able to drive off with a full tank with enough range to easily cover their daily commute. And we're making in-home charging easier by partnering with experienced third-party installers who can even give customers a quote using an app on their smartphone. Now let's talk about mobile charging. Our, our Ford Pass platform enables access to over 2,300 charging sockets across Canada, and that number is growing. And for those who still have concerns about long distance travel, let me give you an example of how we're using connectivity in the vehicle to improve the customer experience. Our brand new distance to empty system integrates with the vehicle navigation for worry-free operation. The customer needs only to enter the destination and the cloud-based system then calculates the route, taking payload, tow towing weight, weather, topography, and even the wind direction into account, providing a precise range and pinpoints a direction to charging as necessary. And the great news is that we have announced that we will be building a battery electric vehicles for North America right here in Ontario. With our investment of $1.8 billion to transform the Oakville Assembly Complex to a BEV manufacturing site, we will produce a family of BEV vehicles for the North America market. This is the first auto assembly plant in Canada that will be fully dedicated to BEV production. And back in September, we made another major announcement regarding our commitments to electrification. Called Blue Oval City, we, we will be building an all new complex on, six, on a six square mile site in West Tennessee that will build the next generation of electric F-series pickups and advanced batteries. Production of new electric vehicles and lithium ion batteries will begin in 2025, as well as the development of a battery plant and joint venture with SK Innovation in Kentucky. Leading in electrification is a critical element as we work together to fulfill the ambitions of our Ford Plus plan. 
Thank you for your time today. I hope the short presentation gives you an overview of what we expect to see in the future relating to transformation to electrified vehicles and manufacturing, as well as Ford's commitment to winning in this space in the years to come. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marlene. So I'm gonna hand it over to our cleanup hitter, Keegan Tully. Keegan Tully is the Managing Director of Power On Energy Solutions, a subsidiary of OPG, Ontario Power Generation, where he oversees the design, build, and operation and maintenance of electric vehicle charging solutions for fleets. He was formerly the General Manager of Ivy Charging Network, where he played a lead role in the launch and build out of the business. He has more than a decade of experience working in the electricity industry and an MBA from the University of Toronto's Rotman School of Management. Keegan, take it away. So I think, you know, Marlene and Anissa really covered uh, the, the topic quite well. So hopefully I'll have some new content uh, for everybody. Uh, so I work at Power on Energy Solutions. It's a, a new subsidiary of Ontario Power Generation, uh, really, really focused on um, doing turnkey uh, solutions for fleet owners. Uh, of, of charging infrastructure and other electricity assets. Um, and I, I think, you know, the, the genesis for this is that fleets really need to focus on core operations and electricity infrastructure is a bit new. And so that's where we're there here to help really. And I think, you know, people might be more familiar with, with OPG, our, our parent company. So OPG is the, the largest uh, power generator in the province. And uh, OPG recently, or, or maybe about a year ago now, I guess, released their climate change plan. And in that, that plan, and OPG committed to being a net zero company by 2040 and a catalyst for a net zero economy by, by 2050. And so, the work that Power Run's doing to electrify transportation is really central to that climate change plan and, and that goal of uh, being a catalyst for a net zero economy by 2050. Uh, in Ontario, on, in that graph on the right there, you, you see, you know, our, our CO2 intensity is one of the lowest in the world and much lower than many uh, jurisdictions that you would think were, were very clean, like Germany. And, and on that chart on the left, you see electricity makes up just 2% of the emissions in, in Ontario, and transportation is the biggest emitting sector in the province. So the, the mission of, of Power On is really to, to take that clean electricity produced by OPG and, and use it to clean up transportation. And what we normally do at, at Power On is, is really work with fleets on solutions that, that meet their cost reliability and, and operational needs to support their, their electrification goals. And we sort of take the scope from the connection to the electricity grid, working with your local electrical utility on that connection piece and all the infrastructure in between right down to the chargers. And, and what we, we mostly see is that fleets, you know, are focused on the, the vehicles them, themselves. And, and so, you know, for different, Customers will see different solutions depending on what their climate change goals are, what their reliability needs. And, and so you could have different elements of backup generation, storage, or, or even solar PV on a site. Now, when we, when we talk about fleet electrification, you know, it, it does get quite complex. Um, you, you're, you know, you're taking often a, a really concentrated amount of vehicles out of sight and, and electrifying them. And it takes a lot of time and detailed planning and a lot of investment as well. You know, I think we heard that from Marlene around the, the cost of, uh, of, of EVs and infrastructure being a barrier to adoption. And it's definitely no exception for fleets. So when, when people are looking to electrify Fleets, you know, fleet vehicle maintenance and fueling is, is a major cost driver. Um, reliability is a business imperative. I, I think Anisia uh, alluded to that. Uh, you know, fleets can't have downtime if the grid is out. And electric vehicles, you know, really require a new approach and, and new um constraints on business operations. So all of a sudden you'll have 
limited range where an internal combustion engine had sort of unlimited range. And then you, you, there's a new way of maintaining vehicles. So if you have, you know, maintainers or operators, it's a whole new uh, system to, to work with. And so, you know, how do fleets get into this and, and tackle this sort of complex shift um, that can deliver, you know, cost savings and, and uh, uh, emission savings, but really do it in an effective way and, and keep up with the competition? Because I, I think we all sort of acknowledge that this, this trend is coming. So what we like to do with, with our customers is really simplify fleet electrification. It's not easy, but you know, it can be done if you really break it down and take the right steps when you're looking to electrify. And what we really encourage all fleets to do is, is really get out in front and plan, start early. Um, you know, it, it takes time to work with local utilities. Uh, you can't necessarily just plug in a, a substantial number of uh, electric vehicle chargers at a site. You might require upgrades from utilities. So it's good to get out there and, and talk to them early uh, and, and understand what, what their requirements are and, and what the timelines are. Um, and, and then I think fleets need to do some sort of inward uh, <laughs> inward contemplation about what their reliability and, and, and price requirements are, you know, how is the fleet, an electrified fleet going to affect those things? And, you know, how, how are you going to treat that? Lots of fleets are out there hedging diesel and want price stability around their, their fuel. How are you going to do that with the electricity side? Is it important to you? What type of downtime on the electricity grid is acceptable and, and what's not? The next thing is really to pilot. Um, we hear a lot when we're talking to fleets, you know, there's a lot of in, internal stakeholders that, that work on vehicles, whether it's the operators, uh, the maintainers, and it's really great to, to do a pilot to get your internal stakeholders aligned and used to the technology instead of trying to jump in with, with both feet. And so we know this trend is coming. We really encourage fleets to get, get out there and pilot and, and get out in front of the trend and get your internal stakeholders more comfortable. Um, at the same time, pilots aren't the same as sort of large fleet depot electrification. Pilots can often be accommodated within existing electrical connections. When you go deeper, it, it requires a lot more planning and there's a lot more implications from electrification. And, and the last step we'd, we'd really encourage is to, to partner. You know, there's parties like WSP and Anisa, Anisia. Um, and, uh, and Power On that really are here to, to help. And so fleets don't have to go and, and do by this by themselves. There's lots of parties out there that can help. So. Talk, talk to people that are in the industry and, and really understand, uh, you know, the power sector and, and can support. Another thing that we, we would really encourage fleets to think about is reliability. Um, you know, as you get deeper and deeper penetration of EVs into your fleet, you, you have this new point of failure that might not have existed before where you have sort of redundant diesel pumps and, and can get the fuel into your vehicles. Um, now, all of a sudden, you're completely reliant on the electricity grid if, if you're installing an electric vehicle fleet. So how are you going to manage the, that reliability? Are you going to install backup assets? Um, and, and how do you maximize the value of those assets? Um, you know, what are you going to do about uh, uh, that that type of thing? You know, fleets rely on, on diesel and they often have the supply on site. So they, they, you really have to start thinking about what your, your requirements are and um, it, it becomes sort of a cost benefit calculation as you're going through this about how much reliability you need and, and where you can find cost savings. You know, the next piece is really around uh, managing, managing costs. Um, the costs that we see from electrification are a little bit different um, than what you would expect with a, an internal combustion engine. So you have this higher 
upfront costs, both related to the vehicle side and, and the charging infrastructure. So how do, how do you manage reliability? Um, how do you optimize the, the solution to really drive down that, that upfront cost? And then going forward, the operating cost is different. There's, there's a real opportunity to lower operating costs. Electric vehicles are much more efficient than internal combustion engines. So they generate uh, significant operational savings. And there's also savings that can be generated on, on the maintenance side. And, but now you have this new commodity that you're consuming much more of in electricity and you know, maybe before you hedge diesel, now what are you going to do on the electricity side? So it's important to think through these these issues. And so at, at PowerOn, I, I think one example that, that we would uh, throw out there for, for uh, to highlight what we're doing with fleets is really our project with the TTC. So we're partnering to, to electrify their bus fleets, which is one of the largest uh, bus electrification projects in North America. Um, we'll be designing, building, operating, maintaining all of the, the on-site electrical infrastructure for the TTC's uh, vehicle fleet. They have eight bus garages ar around Toronto and over 2,200 buses. So it's a pretty major undertaking. Uh, the project's going to go on, on over the next number of years. So we're not jumping into all of that scope, but it's really a, a phased approach to electrification. Um, and it's not just EV chargers. So for reliability, if you think about a, a fleet like the TTC, um, the buses are sort of the last resort. They they have subways, they have streetcars that are both relying on electricity. In the 2003 blackout, buses were the thing that, that was able to come into the city and, and get people out of downtown and, and move them around. And so TTC really, it's important to them to get that reliability. So we'll be installing battery, stationary battery storage, uh, backup power generation. And then there's a huge, a huge aspect of the project to optimizing charging behavior and um, really managing that to, to minimize the infrastructure that, that needs to be installed and, and the, the cost of, of electricity. So the project's pretty large, it's, it's 500, um, million dollars of, of capital for the infrastructure alone over the next number of years so it's a pretty pretty big project but uh you know i think we're just taking it step by step and, and deploying it um and, and with that that that's really all i had and excited to take some some questions excellent well thank you keegan so I, i'd like to ask our, our uh, panelists to turn their video cameras back on um we're going to move on to the q a session uh, you can see on your screen, we have the Q&A um, session at the bottom. So if you have any questions that you want to ask, I'll be happy to moderate them and pass them on to the speakers. Um, to start with, we have a couple of uh, questions here. So the first one is, what policies or programs do you think are needed to enhance the shift to electrification? Should subsidies be continued or renewed? Arlene, maybe you want to start with that one. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say I can I can start with that. Um, so I and I did touch on it a little bit in my presentation. Um, yeah, I mean subsidies or you know incentives are, are key um, in the interim until we reach you know price parity with ICE vehicles. Um, at this time, you know, like buying an electric vehicle is much more costly to consumers than than buying a regular ICE vehicle. Mm -hmm. And um, people, you know, even though you can you can demonstrate there are cost, you know, there are, there are benefits over the life of the vehicle um, to own the EV. People often don't, you know, do that analysis, or or they just, you know, they 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 look at what their you know initial outlay is going to be, and it's going to be much higher, and they need to finance that. So and so it's a deterrent at this point. So we really do need the continuation of the uh, of the uh, government incentive. Um, and in fact, um, I would argue that, you know, um, it needs to be broadened, you know, to include, you know, um, higher MSRPs and, and, and just open it up a little bit more because as more vehicles come on the market um, that have larger batteries, et cetera, um, you know, it, it's, it's, you know, current, the current federal program, for example, limits, you know, what you can get in terms of um, eligible vehicles. 
Yeah, and I, I agree with Marlene. You know, it, in the provinces that have incentives, you see a lot more more sales than than you see in provinces where they don't. And so, you know, the reality is the cost is just higher up front, and and that's really important to consumers. So, the other thing I would say is, you know, the charging infrastructure piece as well. Um, you know, incentives around that would would definitely help speed up adoption as well, because that's another part of the sort of capital cost. Uh, difference in, in EVs and we definitely need a lot more charging infrastructure in homes and, and out on, on the road as well. And I would agree with, uh, with both of you. Um, essentially to me, there, there is also a broader problem about how Canada currently is pricing carbon and how we're pricing carbon right now. Um, you know, in, in the changes that we're going to be seeing uh, around carbon pricing, I think that there are going to be opportunities for more funding towards uh, zero emission vehicles, like actually most definitely, because um, again, you don't truly grasp the cost of, of what's the impact on, on the planet of these vehicles necessarily. So um, by doing so, and with Canada creating more measures uh, to go this way and to, um, you know, implement different types of policies along these lines. I think that uh, we're going to be seeing uh, more opportunities for electric vehicles and not just batteries, but also um, hydrogen. Excellent. All right. Uh, given that the local, uh, the Chamber of Commerce has a lot of smaller businesses as members, uh, as well as some mid-size, of course, and large size, you know, what are the opportunities for small to mid-sized business to get involved in or take advantage of this move to EV and fuel cell vehicles? We've heard about TTC and Amazon and <laughs> OPG and Ford are working it. So what, are there any opportunities for small to mid-sized business to get involved? Yeah, I think there are for anybody that uses vehicles, you know, I think um, whether it's light duty vehicles, heavy duty, um, if, if vehicles are a key part of your business, there's definitely real potential for um, for for savings and operating costs with the, with those vehicles and you know as we get more and more incentives you know Marlene was showing the e-transit you know that that would be a very common vehicle for for many sort of uh, small medium-sized businesses you know that's a, that's a great vehicle and as more and more of that type of vehicle come to the market there's tons of opportunity um, and they, you know you might not have the same level of complexity as some of the, the bigger projects which is great and, and makes it even more cost effective yeah i absolutely agree with Keegan, and I, I i think that um there are if it depends of course on the type of fleet that you're operating but there are also ways to um show innovations in your fleet and get funding through the innovation portion of your work that you're trying to demonstrate so let's say that you're trying to test a, a technology that hasn't been tested that much there are different avenues that uh, you can go through uh, so in quebec for example we have innovate that's a specific program for for, for developing an r d let's say uh, but you could sort of think about you know, thinking about outside, outside the box, basically, because you're really testing a technology that hasn't been tested that much. So you're doing a lot of innovation in itself. And so there are access to funds that are a bit different from what you would typically see. Okay. Yeah, I agree with, with both my panelists. Good. All right, we have another question here. Um, and it's more towards Keegan, I think. But it seems the plan is to use nuclear plants to generate the clean electricity, generally. What will happen with the other plants? Is the are the nuclear plants reliable, given that some of them are shutting down? And I know there's been a lot of question what's going on with Darlington and Bruce and Pickering. So, yeah, I mean, in, in Ontario, we're pretty lucky where where nuclear is sort of the backbone of the the clean electricity supply, um, generating more than fifty percent of of the electricity. Um, you know, OPG's Pickering plant is is closing in the mid 2020s. It's reaching its end of life, so that will take some some of that clean electricity supply out of the system. But uh, both OPG's Darlington plant is currently undergoing a refurbishment, so it'll be around for the long term. And Bruce Bruce Power is doing the same thing with their reactors, so we'll still have a really solid base uh, of of nuclear power in the province. Nuclear is incredibly reliable. Like they will, the units will run for, you know, a long period, like a year plus, without being taken down for outage. Um, so it, it really is the workhorse of the clean energy system. 
And then, you know, OPG is also looking at the next generation of, of nuclear technology, uh, small modular reactors that are, you know, a, a little bit smaller than the traditional reactors to, to really uh, meet the needs of electrification, you know, as we electrify transportation and, and building heat and other things need clean sources um and and so nuclear will be a, a big part of that and we're lucky in ontario too because we have a really diverse mix so we have nuclear as the backbone we have a lot of hydroelectricity you know there's there's wind and solar and um the solution but we really have to be thinking about some of those big long-term uh clean clean sources to to really make sure that we have clean electricity to supply electrification and, and maximize the ghg benefits that makes sense all right there's another question here uh what recommendations would you suggest to our local government to move this forward or what it, what is it that oakville can learn from other municipalities Um, I can I can take a stab at that one. Um, I think for Oakville or any municipality, I mean, it's it's whatever is in their um, their uh, control in terms of like um, programs or bylaws or things like that, like to to incentivize um, you know greater adoption and making it, making it more like easier to do. Um, installing charging stations in public areas would be would be one one potential suggestion. Um, you know, I don't know, working with, um, you know, I mean, look at a Quebec, there's some municipalities in Quebec that offer EV incentives, like, you know, Laval, I think used to do that and others. Um, so it would be a stackable incentive on top of what the federal or provincial government, you know, if, if, if it was available would, you know, they could, could provide. Um, and, and it's so it's, it's, you know, perform giving, you know, maybe educating more or adopting, uh, electric vehicles in their own fleet. Is, is another example is, you know, to, 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 to do it by example. So those are some ideas that um, any municipality can, can undertake. Mm -hmm. And you're right, Mylene, I think um, so Laval did offer some, some incentive. Don't quote me on that, but I think it was anywhere between four to, to $8,000 uh, per vehicle, um, which is, it's, it's pretty great uh, when you think about it. And then um, I think municipalities around the country were starting to see that. So, I'm, I'm not sure if the municipality of Oakville has already done this work, um, but there is, you know, we're seeing strategy for deployment. So uh, where are you going to put your charging stations? There is a real place to innovate again, uh, because traditionally we, we think about cars, but could you think about also the other means of transportation and how you're going to serve the needs of uh, freight transportation, for instance, and things like that, and good movements within your city. Um, so this can be done now, basically. Uh, and you can think outside of the box now and you can strategize on where you're going to be deploying all of this and to get ready for this wave that's about to, that's coming, you know. Um, so, yeah, that's the next step, I'd say, if the municipality hasn't undertaken that. Yeah, and I, I, I agree, you know, there's a big regulatory role for municipalities in terms of sort of zoning and rules about parking and things like that. And, you know, they can... If they're conscious of that, you know, the Oakville can really make it a lot easier to sort of host charging in, in the, the city by just making sure the rules are, are set up to accept it. And then I think, as Marlene was saying, really take a leadership role. And I know Oakville Transit's taking a leadership role in electrifying their fleet, you know, but there's municipalities have big fleets, city ops, um, you know, waste all these different things there's there's a huge opportunity for municipalities to really play a leadership role in, in that space all right i think we have time for two more questions so uh one is uh, battery electric vehicles features heavily relying on battery technology development and the related supply chain for battery manufacture it's also true for the energy storage piece are there assessments done by experts on the volume of primary materials available for producing these batteries um, and how we can sustain that through the long term, and what are the geopolitical implications of the location of those materials? That's a big question. <laughs> I think That's there are many question. questions inside of that one question. And uh, what I can say is, and if the audience is interested, I know that uh, there is an organization in Quebec called Propulsion Quebec, 
that I believe has looked into what it what are the availability like in Quebec because we uh, we do have different mines uh, in Quebec and and specifically uh, that are you know starting to dig for 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 different minerals that are that are going to be required in these uh, batteries. So um, I, I wouldn't say I, I haven't seen a, a study done at a broad level that says exactly like how much supply we have. Uh, it isn't concern for some people. It's a concern for other studies. It's not a concern. I don't think there's a clear answer right now, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay. What I was just going to say on that one, I mean, if you think about it, um, what you need to 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 make batteries, um, it's not going to be a it's, it's a finite resource, right? Minerals are finite. Um, so and so, I think that's where some governments are thinking about recycling, um, and there's recycling programs are going to be important to have like a circular like system right so that uh, at the end of life of a battery you can at least recycle some of the materials that are there um to reuse them again yeah okay we have time for one more question uh and i'm going to give you a nice open-ended one so each one of you can answer uh fast forward to the future where do you see transportation in 10 or 20 years start with keegan yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really bullish on electrification. You know, I, I really, I, I believe we're going to tackle, you know, the climate change challenge and the, the costs uh, are really going to fall in the EVs. And, you know, as people get behind the wheels and it, it, it's more normalized, there's just going to be a rapid shift to, to electrification. And so we're going to see a, a pretty electric future in, in 10, 20 years would be my, my, uh, vote. Okay. And Asa? Yeah, so uh, same as Keegan, I would just add uh, more transit too. Um, so in the next 15 years, I think that a big part of, of it is not repeating what we already have, but transforming the way we move people, which means more transits and, uh, and more shared mobility. And so electric and shared mobility, that's hopefully what we'll see. Yeah. And Marlene? Yeah, I mean, I agree with both of my colleagues here. Um, really, I mean, for Ford, um, the electric like revolution is here to stay. So um, we wouldn't be making all of these investments, large investments, if we didn't think that was the future. Um, and so, um, yeah, by 10 to 20 years, I mean, we're going to see way more EVs on the road and it's going to look very different out there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, well, we're right on uh, five o'clock. So I just wanted to say uh, thank you to Keegan Tully and Aisia Franca, Marlene Charmandy. Um, and I'd like to recognize the Oakville Chamber of Commerce for all of your support and the Professional Engineers Ontario for putting the event together. And of course, all of you for coming out for this great discussion. Hopefully we'll see you at a future event. Thanks a lot so much and drive safe. Thank you. Thank you.